Raspi Blitz is a do-it-yourself lightning node and Bitcoin full node that you can set up and run in your own home and connect external wallets to. Today we're going to go through how to build your own machine from parts, how to set up and utilize the software and everything in between. I am Ben with the BTC Sessions and this is your daily session. Bitcoin. Quick shout out to sponsors of the show, CoinKite.com. These guys just have the best Bitcoin hardware out there. I love it. I love my cold card Mark IV for securing my Bitcoin. Uh, totally air gapped. I love how badass it feels powering it on with a nine volt battery and using an SD card to execute a transaction. Um, but they've got tons of stuff here. They've got the open dime. You've seen me drop those in different cities for little scavenger hunts. Uh, the block clock is an absolute staple for a Bitcoiners. Uh, well, I mean, you can see it there for a Bitcoiners bookshelf and they have the block clock micro on the way out. I just saw it. It's, uh, it's, on its way out off the assembly line. So those should be dropping soon. So you can reserve one now if you like. And of course they got things like the sats card, the tap signer, all this great stuff. Check them out, coinkite.com. Go to the store and use code BTC sessions for 5% off everything there. Shakepay.com if you're in Canada, easy way to be stacking sats. You can e-transfer in and out, no deposit or withdrawal fees. There's a thin spread. And if you use the link down below to sign up and buy your first hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, they'll give you 30 bucks for free. You also get 30 bucks every time you share your link with friends and family and they sign up and do the same. You can shake your phone every single day for free sats. You can get a sats back visa card to make all your purchases and earn extra Bitcoin. Just tons of stuff happening over at ShakePay check them out and again the link is down below up next leaden.io you can use your bitcoin for a ton of different services with these guys they've been very useful for me anytime that i'm in a cash flow crunch i need dollars but i don't want to sell certain bitcoin well i can deposit bitcoin here get a loan of dollars to my bank account within 24 hours and when i pay back those dollars i get back the same amount of bitcoin so that is very very useful especially if i'm looking to avoid things like capital gains tax or if i'm looking to avoid having to buy back in at a higher price now these guys also have savings accounts for bitcoin and usdc where you can earn uh you know some quote unquote yield on your bitcoin or stable coins whatever it may be um, and the nice thing here is that they do have quarterly audits from a third party which you can cryptographically verify that you do indeed have your holdings included in that audit so you don't get jerked around celsius style they got their b2x offering they got bitcoin bag mortgages they got it all so check them out start.ledin.io slash btc sessions on next bitrefill.com i do live on bitcoin and this really really helps because i can pick up just every every gift card i can imagine using bitcoin both on chain and via the lightning network i do that all the time you earn sats back as you shop you can also earn additional sats back via the referral program you can top up phones you can top up lightning channels and if you're in the us you can pay bills and get on a bitcoin standard so again check them out links are below but bitrefill.com and finally, if you're backing up any important Bitcoin wallet, get it in solid steel. For instance, when we back up our node and we get our 24 uh, seed words, that's kind of important. So you want to get it not on a piece of paper because you have to worry about fire damage, water damage, all that stuff. The bill file gets it in solid steel. So you don't have to worry about those things anymore. It keeps them nice and safe. Uh, and this is how I'm backing up my important Bitcoin wallets. So be sure to check them out, privacypros.io. Uh, slash BTC sessions, you get a little discount at checkout. So be sure to check them out. And with that, let's dive into the tutorial. So let's talk prerequisites and what you're going to need to put this project together. Uh, first off, if you're very early in Bitcoin and you're unsure even how to get Bitcoin or transact with Bitcoin, this might not be the best place to start. You're gonna want some uh, prerequisite knowledge in and around how to use a Bitcoin wallet, how to transact, all that kind of stuff. So if you're at that level, 
I would recommend going back, looking at some of my other videos around how to get Bitcoin, how to set up your own Bitcoin wallet and the basics of transacting. Start there and then lead up towards this over time. Uh, also hardware wallets or somewhere else you probably wanna look at before diving down the rabbit hole of setting up your no own node. However, if you are there, let's chat about what you're gonna need uh, in terms of parts and what you're gonna need in terms of software. So I'll pull up my screen here. So this is the Raspi Blitz GitHub. This has a full breakdown of more or less everything we're gonna be doing today. And there's tons of links and all kinds of great stuff here, but this is also where you're gonna get your software that you're gonna need. Um, so just so you know, there will be a separate device that sits and it will be plugged in to your home router. Okay, and then you'll be able to access this device just by going on your home computer or your laptop or whatever it may be, as long as you're on the same network and just using your browser. So that's how you're gonna be accessing this. Now, um, we will be downloading the software for this from uh, the GitHub. There's a link and we'll go through that when we get setting it up. You're also gonna to need to download a program called Bellina Etcher. That's at bellina.io, and you're just gonna install that on your computer, and we'll be using that momentarily. Let's chat parts though. So this is gonna be running on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I am using a Ros Raspberry Pi uh, 4 Model B, okay? Um, and so you can use um, older versions of Raspberry Pis if you've got one kicking around. Absolutely. Now, the pricing on Raspberry Pis at the time of recording this video are much higher than they have been previously, okay? Um, this is due to supply constraints uh, with shutdowns over the past couple of years and everything. It, they're just not as available as they used to be. Prices may change moving forward. So if you're looking at this video, looking at some of the prices saying, geez, that's a lot more than I wanna spend, go and check them afterwards and see if they have changed because they very well may have. Uh, these prices are likely to come down as more and more of these hit the market. Nonetheless, you're gonna need a Raspberry Pi. I would say go with a four. Um, threes may be a little bit slower for your purposes. And then also everything I'm gonna be referring to will fit with the four as opposed to the threes. So just be conscious of which one you're going with. Uh, nonetheless, Raspberry Pi 4B. Uh, you're gonna need an SD card, a micro SD card. I'd say 32 gigabytes should do you just fine. Um, I This one on the screen is a high endurance one. It'll last longer, less likely to fail. Uh, however, other versions will work as well. So it's up to you what you're willing to spend on a micro SD card. Uh, you're gonna need a hard drive. SSDs are faster and easier um, in terms of loading up the Bitcoin blockchain, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, a Western Digital Blue, it's pretty decent. One terabyte uh, is will probably do you, but if you're really, really looking to future-proof, then maybe you might go for a two terabyte. Again, totally up to you. Um, there's a one terabyte on the one I'm using today. You're also gonna need an enclosure for your hard drive. So this is an example of one, Wavelink, it's a USB 3.0. Basically your hard drive just goes inside of this. And one thing, um, given the case that I'm using, uh, I would recommend getting one that, see how the port is in the middle of the drive there? Uh, that will make it much less of a pain when trying to get that inside of the case that I'm using, that's what I've found, uh, but they also have other recommendations on a website I'm about to talk about. Now, you're also gonna need a power supply. It's very important that you get a Raspberry Pi official power supply because if the power supply is not constant or you know, if you get lulls, um, which can happen with other types of plugins, then you can have your uh, your Raspberry Pi or your Raspberry Pi Blitz going offline occasionally, and you don't wanna to have to deal with that. So just get a good plug-in, get an official Raspberry Pi uh, plug. Uh, and then finally, you're gonna need a, uh, you're gonna need an ethernet cable to plug your Pi into your router. Now, all of the things I've just mentioned, in some flavor or another, you're going to need. 
moving forward from here, you can either follow what I'm doing, my setup as I've done it, or you can go um, a little bit lower key uh, and keep it a bit more basic. Okay, so what I'm gonna be rocking here is I am using the Triton from Crypto Cloaks as my case because it's just so damn pretty. Uh, I love this thing. So I actually had previously used this for another node. I've since updated it to be my Raspberry Blitz. Um, so anyways, this is what I'm gonna be using. They do have an all metal version of this. I have just the, the regular 3D printed non-metal version. Um, also, uh, a screen. So this is an example of a screen that you could use. Uh, it's specifically for Raspberry Pi 4, however, the one that I have actually was for a Pi 3. Uh, it seemed to still work just fine. And so you'll kind of see how I muddled through figuring out how to make that work or just kind of guesstimated how it would work. And it did. Uh, but nonetheless, here's a perfect example of one that you can get. And you would just uh, plug that in and I'll show you exactly how that sets up. The touch screen is irrelevant. It just matters that you have a screen. And you don't even necessarily need a screen, I should say. Um, you can still access the Pi via your browser. You don't need to have a screen on it. I was using it prior to having a screen and then plugged it in afterwards, just so you know. Uh, if you want the fancy looking fans that light up and do all the fancy looking things, then you're gonna be grabbing uh, some of these Geek Pi cooling fans. I have three of them. Uh, running in this you don't need three I would say you don't even really need the fans necessarily but I think it looks cool and I wanted to go all out with this one uh, and then because of all the stuff being plugged in I got some uh, jumper wires these are just like extender cables for the things that I'm plugging into the Pi and I will show you how to do this as we go through, but I found this pack for, you know, it's just under 10 bucks and you get a ton of these um, and they will do you just fine. Uh, and then finally, if uh, the setup that I'm showing you here with the, the Triton case and the fans and the screen and everything are a little too much and you're like, listen, I just want something basic. Uh, this is a good alternative. This is a Pi armor case. It is a heat sink. So rather than having fans, it just disperses the heat throughout this metal case that you literally just screw on to the front and the back of the device. It just screws together very simply. Um, and yeah, this is a great alternative and it will work just fine with the screen because you see these little pins here on the device. Well, that screen that I showed you it literally will just slide on top, okay? So it'll just slide on top of those pins and you don't need to do any fancy installation. You don't need any cords or cables or anything like that. It's just, you screw it together and you plunk the screen on top of it. I tested that myself prior to this, works just fine, uh, but that's not the setup I'm gonna be doing today. I'm gonna be doing all these fancy uh, Triton and fans and and screen and all of that, okay? Uh, and that is it. I know that's a lot. Uh, I will list all of the options in the show notes down below, but there's our parts, there's our software. Let's get into building this thing. So the first thing that we're gonna do is actually get our micro SD card set up and plugged into our Raspberry Pi. So we're gonna do this from the github.com slash rootsole slash Raspi Blitz uh, page. So I'll have that link down below. And on this page again, I showed you before, but you can scroll down. There's tons of instructions and various things to do here, but there's gonna be one that says download the software. When you click on that, you will be taken to this page here where it says downloading the software. And you can just simply click on where it says download 1.8.0 or if you're watching this later on, it may be a newer, more updated version of the software. Uh, anyways, you're gonna download this and I have it currently downloading in the bottom of my screen. I clicked on it. And uh, then you're gonna queue up Belina Etcher once it is downloaded. So we'll jump to that momentarily. Okay, so we've got the file downloaded. I've opened Belina Etcher on my computer and we're gonna choose flash from file. We're gonna choose the file we just downloaded, which is this Raspberry Blitz one. We're gonna hit open. <clears throat> we're gonna select target. That's gonna be your SD card. 
and it will let you know, it will warn you, hey, this is a large drive, maybe you don't want this one. Yeah, this is it right here. Um, I selected that, and then we're just gonna hit flash. This will take a little bit of time. It may require a password, which I'm entering now. This will just be your computer password. All right, and this will take the operating system of Raspberry Blitz and it will put it onto the SD card so that your Raspberry Pi knows what to do. Uh, so we'll be back when this is finished. Once everything is wrapped up, you'll get this message that the flash is complete and you can then pop out your SD card from your computer and uh, and this is important, you're gonna do this before assembling everything else, but you're gonna take uh, the Raspberry Pi at the bottom of it, there's gonna be uh, a little slot, and you can just plunk the SD card in like so. All right, and now we can move on to assembly. Okay, so I've got everything laid out in front of me here. Um, you notice a few things are a little bit different depending on what you've picked up. Uh, just so you know, this Raspberry Pi I've used before, that's why there are heat sinks on it. It will look a little bit different than a brand new one that you just got. You can ignore that. This is just something, again, to disperse the heat uh, and you likely won't need to add this if you're using fans or if you're using the alternative case, which I just talked about, but I wanted to show you um, kind of the lower end version of what I'm about to do here. Here's another Raspberry Pi with that heat sink case on it. And you can see basically it just screws together on the top and the bottom of the board. So same, same idea. These are different Raspberry Pis. This is a three, just so you know, but nonetheless, um, I just wanted to show you how it would look with the screen on on this. Um, so basically, again, this just affixes together and there's a little, there's four little screws that hold it together. And the screen, very simply, you would just put and slide so that the pins go in. And that's it. <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. Of course, yes, you have your SD card, which is here, um, going into the Raspberry Pi, uh, and then you would have a power cable going into it, a little bit different on the three than the four, and then you'd have your uh, your internet connector, your ethernet cable going in and plugging into your router. But more or less, that's it. That's, that's the whole device. I'm gonna be using this screen uh, with my Pi 4 and I'm going to be using a bunch of cables to hook it up But there's your alternative just so you know roughly what it looks like make sure you get the right case for your Pi If you have a Pi 4 um, Just yeah, make sure you're not picking up something for a different model. Okay uh, Let's just throw together a couple quick things here and then we'll get into the wiring I already have some wires set out. I already have this set up. I just disassembled it to reassemble it. But nonetheless, uh, if you get that bag of cables, that's what these sitting around are. Now, in terms of tools that you're gonna need, I just basically have a, a little screwdriver. That's pretty much all I'm using. In some instances, like with uh, this, you may need a, uh, an Allen key. Um, I've got a I've got a bunch of them kicking around. I can't recall if you get one with the actual Triton if you order it. Nonetheless, you can just again, it's easy to pick up rings of Allen keys. So uh, you may need an Allen key to affix this. I'm not using it today because I've got some other screws that I was using. Um, just so you know. Okay. So let's start simply. Let's start with the hard drive. Here's the uh, enclosure that I I mentioned in the setup. Pretty much, you take the enclosure, you take the hard drive, you pop it in like a Nintendo cartridge, and you close it up. And that's pretty much it. This thing just slides on, like that, like so. And uh, you take the connector cable, plug it in. This will plug into the Pi afterwards. Okay, hard drive, done. Now, these fans over here, I just wanted to show you. The reason that we have extender cables for these is these are going to be screwed in inside of the case and these cables don't reach all the way to the Raspberry Pi. So 
what I've done is I've just grabbed, I, I wanted to keep the colors the same. And pretty much the way it works is you're gonna be looking for a cable in your pack that has one end male and one end female, meaning one has the protrusion at the end, okay? When you're connecting them, pretty much, you just right in there, there. Now the cable is extended. That's pretty much all you need to do. You do black and black, red and red, although it does not matter because they're all the same cable, but pretty much uh, you just use these whenever you need to extend that cable a little bit further than it was reaching before. And uh, yeah, we'll do that with all three fans. So this is the part of the video where you get to laugh at me a little bit, but uh, this kind of just shows a little bit of the journey and how you just figure things out if you don't understand them. So my main issue here is I wanted to have the screen uh, to, to display all the information on it, but I also wanted to have these fans, right? I, I liked the look of the, the kind of LED glowing lights inside. The problem with this particular screen is when you put it onto the Pi, it takes up a bunch of these pins. And some of these pins are for power, i.e. they would be powering the fans. Well, that's no good. And I need some of those power pins. There are, and I'm gonna show a diagram of where these plug in, but there are uh, the first couple pins here. Those are, are power and, and grounding cables and everything. And if I take all of them up, I can't do all of them at the same time. Now I realized that this screen only needs power once, uh, but I was looking online and I just, I couldn't find which pins would be necessary and which ones would not be necessary. So effectively what I did is I said, okay, well, I'll just make sure that there's power going to this and I'll make sure that there's a grounding cable going to it. And then I'll, I'll just exclude any of the power pins that I'm gonna need for the fans and I'll just leave everything else plugged in. So basically, I went through and I said, okay, I'm going to need this one and this one. I figured out which pins I would need in order to power the fans. And then I just plugged the rest of them <laughs> into the back of the board and then directly as they would go into the pins here. So I'm going to plug in all these pins. I'm going to show you what that looks like. And then we'll take a look at the diagram after. Okay, I'm partway through. I just want to show you kind of what I'm doing here. Basically, I took pins and I plugged them into the back of the screen uh, and I, found, I find it easiest to just do one row at a time. So I've done the top row, okay, the top of the screen over here. I did the top row excluding the first pin because that's one of the power pins that I'm going to need, all right? Um, and then I've just gone directly to where that would have plugged in had I just affixed the screen to the Raspberry Pi. So just straight direct across and I've done, again, the top row, excluding the first pin on the Pi, to straight uh, cable to cable. Colors are irrelevant, um, they're all the same cable. Also, I'm super colorblind, fun fact. So now I'm gonna do the second row. I'm also going to exclude the first pin, but I'm also gonna exclude pin number nine. And this is on a Raspberry Pi 4B. Uh, I, I believe that would transfer also to if you're using a three. Nonetheless, excluding pin number one and pin number nine in the second row. All right, so we've got everything running. Uh, you can see that on the screen and on the Pi, the first two pins have been omitted, so nothing connected there. And then you can see here, or not, there's an empty slot that's pin number nine on the second row. Same thing here on the Pi. Pin number nine on the second row is left open because we're gonna need that one. Let's jump to the fans now. Okay, so I just wanted to note that the three pins that I've left open here are all power, okay? So the top one, the bottom one here, and the other one in the middle, those are all different uh, power pins. So the top one is a five volt and the other one are 3.3 volt. Doesn't matter which fan is getting which power <clears throat> and the screen already has power in one of these already connected cables. So uh, the power needs to go to the red cable 
on your fans. Now, I left this one short. This is going to be the top fan inside of my enclosure, uh, and I just found that you don't really need it to go too far. Uh, so, I'm going to plug this one into the top pin on the top left of the Pi. And that is my five volt pin, so that will power the fan. But then we need this black cable to go to a ground, okay? And so the grounds, and again, I'll show the uh, diagram later, but I know that the ground, the first three pins, no, yes, no, yes. So I'm gonna go to this pin here, which is a ground, and we'll see the diagram momentarily. Okay, so this will be affixed to the side, the inside of the enclosure. All right, then I have another one of these, um, and this fan is going to go to the 3.3 volt here. Okay, so the other power pin. And then, let's see, I will get this one going to the bottom right pin that is another ground, okay? So that is no plugged in. Again, as I'm wiring this, just know that you will see the diagram and I'll leave a link for it. The last one is going to be on the bottom right of the enclosure and we're gonna screw this all together momentarily. So I need power and I said the last remaining power one was the empty pin in the middle. So I'm gonna plug in my red cable there All right, red cable is plugged in. And now I just need to plug in to the final ground, uh, which I'll do the one right. Right there. Okay. So I now have my three fans connected and my screen connected. I know this is a mess. Uh, but it looks kind of cool under the lights inside. So let's get this screwed into place inside our enclosure. Here is that diagram of the pinout on a Raspberry Pi 4. You can see the ones that I left open, the 5 volt and the 3.3 volt, and then down along the bottom here, another 3.3 volt. And then you can also see the ground cables that I used or the ground pins that I used the bottom right and then these two up top were the ones that we used for our fans. The rest of these on the front portion of the pinout were all used up by the screen and I found it fine to just leave them be. I didn't have to uh, go and start pulling cables and worrying about that. There was plenty enough to plug all of my fans in. So uh, I will link this diagram down below if you need to clarify where you're plugging things into. So here's the inside of my Triton. Uh, this is just a sticker that I've thrown in there previously. Um, so pretty much you see the four screws at the back there or uh, the ability to screw something in there that is going to be our Pi. And our Pi, you can see, has four little screw holes in it. We're going to affix it there. We did the wiring first because it is a veritable nightmare trying to do this when the Pi is already screwed into place. I know, I tried. <laughs> so we're just going to literally set this down inside and then screw in uh, the Pi first and then the, uh, the fans, okay? So we'll see what that looks like momentarily. All right, all screwed into place. Now I've used kind of these longer spacers in there as opposed to regular screws. You can just use the screws that are supplied. I just happen to have uh, a box of these and for me it's just nice and easy to be able to reach in there and do them that way. Okay, so we've got that. Now we just need to affix our, uh, our fans to the inside of the case and you can see there's just two little open screw holes uh, for each fan and we'll just affix those and we'll see what that looks like in the end. And this is what it looks like when all of the fans are affixed to the side and we've got our screen right here. All right, all hooked up and that will plunk somewhere down here. Uh, but in the meantime, we do need to get our hard drive, our power cable, all that set up. So let's get that going. 
For the hard drive that I'm using, I'm going to slide it underneath in this slot here. And then I'm going to take the cable. I showed you how to connect it earlier. But this is what I was talking about in terms of getting one where the port is somewhere in the middle. Makes it a hell of a lot easier. In fact, it might be impossible uh, if you don't have that port in the middle. So make sure you get one that fits. Uh, there are smaller alternatives that might be able to fit in the main part here, but uh, in my experience, this has worked pretty well for me. So I just give that a little push, and that is now set, and I can uh, just plug this in to one of the USB ports here. And if you want to clean up the cables and, and uh, you know, put something around them, a rubber band or whatever, that's fine, but I just plug it into the back there, and uh, maybe I'll put something around that. Okay, uh, outside of that, we also need, let's do the power cable first. So again, this is a, an actual Raspberry Pi official power source. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna feed it through one of the, the holes back here. And this simply, I'll just get the screen out of the way, this simply goes into the power right here at the bottom of the Pi. So there we go. That will obviously plug into the wall when we're ready. And then finally, you just need your network cable, you need your uh, ethernet cable, and that goes into the back of the Pi here. And this end will plug in to your router. Okay, so we're effectively all set here. Um, now, I, what I'm gonna say about the screen here is, and of course I'm losing cables, but uh, nonetheless, should be fine. There we go. Okay, so in regards to the screen, uh, I kind of found, I don't really have a good way of fixing it yet, but I did find that when I put the cables off to the side and I get them, it does just kind of stand there. Um, and then when we fix, this just screws onto the front. It seems to sit and look pretty decent, but if you have suggestions of good ways to affix this, then uh, let me know in the comments down below. I'll just get this on and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, it's time for our moment of truth. We've got everything linked up. I put the cover on, screen is just sitting there nicely inside. Remember, we already have the, the firmware flash onto our SSD card, which is in the Raspberry Pi already. We have our, uh, our SSD, our video, or rather our hard drive, which is linked up to the Raspberry Pi as well. We have our ethernet cable going down into our router, or rather our splitter, I guess. this I have a splitter because I have a whole bunch of stuff running here. Uh, and then we have our power cable, the little white one coming out the back. And I just gotta plug that thing in down below. So without further ado, let's see how this thing goes. Well, that's a good sign. We've got light, we've got things happening. And pretty quick here, we should see some messaging on the screen. And just wanted to quickly show what this thing looks like when it's all up and running. And there it is. All set. Screen has all the stats from my Lightning node. And I can access it via the computer. Once you boot up your machine and get everything all plugged in, all you're gonna do is you're gonna use uh, a program to scan your local network for the IP address of your device. Now I'm using, I'm on a Mac, uh, I'm using a program called LandScan, but uh, a really easy option is Angry IP Scanner, and that is free and you can download that for Mac or for Windows, uh, whatever you please. And you just search and you can see I've highlighted the one I was looking for. I do have a couple other nodes running right now for experimentation, but you'll see something that says Raspberry Pi. And if you right click it, you'll be able to copy the IP address, which will be listed under the IP address column here. So I've copied that information and we're going to paste that in to our browser to begin accessing our Raspberry Blitz. All right, so 
we've put our IP address into uh, the address bar of our browser, and we see this, our setup options for Raspberry Blitz. So we're gonna set up a fresh Raspberry Blitz and hit continue. Now it says, is it okay to delete all the data on your hard drive? And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. Now we're gonna give the name, we'll call it uh, sessions test. Oh, and uh, just contain numbers and characters. Hit continue. And then you're gonna choose which lightning implementation you would like to use. LND and Core Lightning will do you both just fine. In this instance, I'm gonna be using Core Lightning because I've done LND in other videos. We'll hit continue. Now, you're gonna have a password that you're gonna set up here. So I'm going to uh, put in a password and then repeat it. And then hit okay. And then you're gonna have a secondary password as well. And this is for additional apps that you can install on the Raspi Blitz. So the first one is just for the Raspi Blitz itself. And then okay. Now this is gonna be your C Lightning password again, and up to you how you set these up, uh, but obviously things that you will remember. And okay. Everything is ready to set up your Raspi Blitz. Start setup. A few moments later. After initial setup, you will be showing your seed phrase, which uh, applies to the wallet, the on-chain wallet where you can deposit Bitcoin and then use it to open up lightning channels. Um, Obviously, I am showing you this seed phrase because I'm gonna go through this process again and get an entirely different one after the fact, but this is what it'll look like. You will write down all of these words and keep them somewhere safe. Uh, keep in mind, if somebody gets a copy of this, they have access to all of the funds on your nodes. So please store it carefully. Don't share it with others. Don't share it digitally or don't store it digitally. Rather, uh, write it down or get it in solid steel or wh however you're going to go about doing it. But store it somewhere safe and uh, external to your local setup. And at that point, you can go ahead and click OK, do final reboot. After a quick reboot, you will see the Raspi Blitz initial sync screen. And what's happening here is you are downloading an entire copy of the Bitcoin blockchain, which includes all of the previous transactions that have ever happened, as well as the rules that govern the network. So you will see the sync progress slowly work its way up to 100% after which you'll be able to, again, log on and see your full dashboard. If you do need to shut down, you can hit the shutdown button here at any point. And as it says, the sync will continue on the next restart. Uh, now this does take some time, depending on the hardware that you're working with. It could take a little while. For me, I found with pretty good internet connection and um, a pretty decent set of hardware, it can take in and around, I'd say two to three days, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Again, really depends on what you're working with, but give it some time and in a few days time, you will be up and ready to go. So we'll just flash forward to that point. And here it is in all its glory, your Raspi Blitz dashboard once everything is all synced up. So just a quick overview of what we see in front of us. We are on our home screen right now. We see uh, a balance total up top here, on chain just below that, and uh, designated to lightning channels just below that. And currently we obviously have not sent any funds to the node yet. We also have our receive and send screens. We have our open channel button. We have our list channels button so we can see any channels we do have open. Over to the right hand side is where any transactions, any historical transactions will be listed. Below that we have uh, connection details. So connection details allow you uh, to connect to your node remotely via Tor. Uh, it also allows you to connect to your node via SSH, which I will show momentarily. And it shows your node ID here as well. Um, all of those are currently covered up. Um, to the right, hardware details, um, how much CPU is being used, the temperature, the RAM being used, the disk space being used out of the total. 
below that what version of bitcoin you're running uh the network that you're on the blocks synced so i'm 100 percent synced uh, the size of the blockchain itself any uh connections that you have so how many peers how many other nodes are you linked up to syncing with and the block time and then just to the right of that you have lightning what version you're running so i'm running c lightning the late, latest version um how many channels uh, are not only open but actually communicating uh, local channel balance um, remote channel balance so this is outgoing this is incoming pending local balance pending remote balance so any channels that aren't officially confirmed yet would be found here uh, up to the top right there's a little sandwich board just for a few little settings you can display in sats or in decimals full bitcoin and this is your dark mode toggle switch dark mode is on by default as it should be <laughs> over to the left here uh you have your apps these are applications that you can download and install on your raspi and we're going to be adding a, a couple of these momentarily and then on your settings screen, you have the ability to change your password, your main password. Uh, you can reboot the device or shut it down and then it shows what version of Raspi Blitz you are, the web UI, all of that information is right here. Now, while we're here, uh, I want to install a few things just so you can see what some of these applications do. And we're going to use some of these applications to set up our lightning uh, channels and set up this node. So uh, first thing I want to install is Ride the Lightning. Once installed, you'll see Ride the Lightning bump up into the installed category above and more available to apps down below. The only other one that I'd like to add for now is going to do uh, going to be mempool.space. So I hit install there and let that one do the installing as well. With those items installed, we're ready to go. Now, I just wanted to note that um, in particular with BTC Pay Server and LN Bits, I'm not gonna be covering those applications in this video as I've actually done other dedicated videos for those. So if you wanna check those out, you can just search on my YouTube channel for BTC Pay Server or for LN Bits if you're curious about what those apps have to offer. And uh, there are other applications as well, I'm sure, that Raspi Blitz will be adding. And uh, if you see others of interest, then be sure to search my channel for those as well. So you have your Raspi Blitz up and running. You've installed a couple applications. And now we want to get our Lightning node up and functioning and fund it open some channels. So we're going to do exactly that. Now from the app screen here, you just choose the app you want to use and you're going to hit open. Now you can do this from the home screen, kind of our main screen where uh, we have those transaction ops and options to send and receive and view our channels. But Ride the Lightning is an application that is a lot more versatile and gives you a much better overview of everything. So we're going to be utilizing Ride the Lightning for the bulk of this tutorial when it comes to uh, utilizing your lightning node. So when you hit open in another tab, you'll see ride the lightning pop up and you'll be able to see everything that you need to know about your lightning node and then utilize it using some of the menu items over on the left here. So just a quick overview of what we're looking at, our node information, there's our alias. We'll take a look at how to change that as it's clear that I already have here in the background. Uh, what implementation of Lightning you're using, uh, the chain, um, the main chain that you're using, your routing fees, uh, balances that you have both in Lightning and on-chain and a total, any channels that you have pending and inactive and active, and uh, individual channels over here off to the side with options to open more. There are also separated out, you have your on-chain screen. So this is to receive funds into your Lightning wallet and then create channels. You have Lightning, which there's a drop-down menu for, so you can see your peers, transactions, routing, reports, graphs, all kinds of great stuff over here. And then you have your configurations over here, which is uh, kind of the look of this interface as well as any of the uh, details you need from the config file which we're not going to really go into you can also enable fiat conversion if you want to see a dollar value um, 
I'm not going to deal with that right now, but I would like to change the look of this screen. So first up, I'd like to see it in dark mode. And let's see here, colors. I think, uh, I think I'll go with that first option. So I'm just going to hit update here. All right. And now we have a new layout. First thing we need to do is we need to get some funds into our on-chain wallet so that we can use those to open some lightning channels. So right here in the on-chain menu, which I've selected from the left, is we're going to receive Bitcoin. So we need to generate an address. So we're gonna hit generate address, and this gives us a Bitcoin address that we can send to. So I'm just gonna hit copy, and we'll jump to an external wallet that I have open now. To do that, I'm going to copy this address right here. I am going to jump over to my other screen here. I have a wallet open, it's called Sparrow Wallet. Now, I have done a full tutorial on how to utilize Sparrow Wallet. So if you're unfamiliar with the interface here, feel free to go back and look at that. I'll have it in the show notes down below. But really simply, I'm just gonna jump over to the send screen. I'm going to paste in that address. Actually, that did not copy properly. So I'll just copy there and then paste. There we go. Okay, and always good idea to double check your addresses, by the way. Um, I'll put in a little note that's going to ride the lightning and I'm gonna send over five million sats, uh, 0.05 Bitcoin, AKA. Uh, we're gonna set a transaction fee. I want this to go through relatively quickly because I'm doing a tutorial. Um, that looks all good, okay. And we shall create, sign, and broadcast. Off it goes. And just a side note here, as this transaction gets sent off, that you could obviously be sending this from any Bitcoin wallet that you may have. It's all the same. And if I jump back here, uh, you could also scan this from a mobile wallet via the QR code that is displayed on the screen. Nonetheless, I'll hit X here, and uh, we should see an update with um, an, a pending on-chain transaction momentarily. So that transaction has now landed as, and is available on my node. And we know this because here in our Raspi Blitz uh, Ride the Lightning app, under balances on chain, we can see 5 million sats sitting there. I can also go over to the left to the on chain tab and I see a total balance of 5 million sats there, as well as it is also confirmed. Down below, I can see the actual UTXO that is landed. And finally, on our main Raspi Blitz home screen, over on the right under transactions, we can see that incoming transaction for 5 million sats. So what we wanna do now that we have a balance is we actually want to uh, connect to a peer and open a channel. So we're gonna find another lightning node to connect with and open an outbound channel. Now outbound channels allow you to spend Bitcoin on the lightning network, allow you to send out of your node and through a peer and anybody that they're also connected to and so on and so forth. So we're gonna be using this website. It is called terminal.lightning.engineering and it gives you a list of the top performing nodes on the network. You can scroll through, see lots of different information on, on them. Uh, so it basically shows you its ranking, uh, the alias of the node itself, connection info, how many good peers and how many total peers they have. Good peers being other nodes that are also well connected. Um, the capacity of the entire node, how much Bitcoin is locked up there um, between them and their peers, the age of the node, so on and so forth. So just as an example, I'm going to go to uh, node number five here. I'm going to click on it. It's going to give me a whole bunch of different information. I can see uh, roughly half of the peers that are connected to it are, are pretty good ones, have good connections themselves. So that's, that's great to know. Now down below under connect, I can see the connection information that I'm going to need to add this node as a peer. Uh, and so I'm going to go to the last option, the Tor address here, and I'm going to hit the copy button. All right. 
and I'm going to use that information on my own node. So jumping back to Ride the Lightning, we're going to go to Lightning over on the left. We're going to choose the drop down menu and click on Peers slash Channels. Under Connections, we're going to tap on Peers and we're going to add a peer. And this is where we can paste in the information we've just copied on that node. Right there, we're going to hit Add a Peer. Now I jumped ahead a little bit here, but uh, after a minute or so, you should see peer added, or if there's difficulty connecting with a particular peer, it'll give you an error message and you'll have to try maybe one of the other options to connect or choose a different node to connect to. Everybody's settings are a little bit different, so some nodes may be picky about who connects to them. Next, we're going to open a channel. It does give this as optional, but we're gonna go ahead and do that right now. And I'm gonna open a channel for 2 million sats. Now it lets me know that my remaining balance will be 3 million sats, okay? Uh, the fee rate, we can choose. It defaults to urgent. I'm gonna leave it that way because I'm doing a tutorial and I want it to happen quick. And then I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna hit the open channel button. Now you may end up getting an error like this. It says, hey, there's a minimum channel size of 0.03 BTC. So if that's the case, you can weigh that. Do you want to open a channel with this peer or do you want to find another peer to connect to? In this case, uh, I've got 5 million sats on this particular node. Uh, 0.03 Bitcoin or 3 million sats is about 60% of the Bitcoin that I want to lock up. I'd like to have a couple different channels and some Bitcoin left over. So I'm going to choose a different peer. We'll come back and we will for now, hit do it later, and we'll add a different peer to connect to. If you choose, if there's a connected peer that you don't wish to associate with, you can disconnect from that particular peer. I'll do that now just as an example. And that will just remove it from my list of peers that I can open channels with. We'll go shopping for another one. Okay, so I've gone down the list further on uh, the Lightning Terminal, and I found a peer that I'd like to connect to. So I've added them as a peer as we did before, set my open channel to 2 million sats, fee rate unchanged from before. I'm gonna hit open channel and see how this one goes. All right, we can now see channel added successfully. And if we uh, go to channels, uh, and we hit pending slash inactive. We can see there's a pending open and all that's gonna we're gonna wait for is for the channel to be opened and that will happen when there is a couple or a few confirmations on the Bitcoin blockchain. In the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna find another peer to open a channel with and when they are both confirmed, we'll take a look at what that looks like. All right, so we now have two channels that have been connected and are completely synced up, confirmed on the Bitcoin blockchain and uh, operating. So we can see that from our dashboard. We see under balances, Lightning now says 4 million sats. On-chain now says 997,000 sats. That's just from the transactions and the transaction fees. Connecting it otherwise, it would be 1 million. Uh, down below where it says channels, it says two active channels with a capacity of 4 million sats. Furthermore, if we go to Lightning and we go to peers and channels, we can see um, under channels on open, there are two here. There's the original one I did with Satbase. There's another one I opened up with Wallet of Satoshi. And both of those are outbound channels, all right? So local balance is 2 million sats on each one. That means I can send out 2 million sats from each one. Remote balance is currently zero, mean, meaning there's no inbound capacity on these channels. And that's what we're gonna address next. Uh, but really quick, let's take a look at Raspberry Blitz, the main screen here. Again, we have our nice little uh, overview here, total balance of just shy of 5 million sats, on-chain 997,000, Lightning 4 million, and we see some of the transactions going in and uh, going out rather as I was establishing those channels. Um, if you're wondering, if you're getting technical here and you're wondering why so many, I had to bump the fees a couple times uh, just because it was a busy day on the Bitcoin blockchain. 
Uh, so with that, we can now move in to getting inbound channels. That is next. A lot of people find that inbound liquidity or getting inbound channels um, can be one of the trickier parts of initially setting up your Lightning node. Not for the technical part of it, but figuring out who is willing to lock up liquidity or lock up their Bitcoin with you so that you are able to receive transactions. So. Um, First, I want to show you where you're going to get the information in order to give that to somebody so that they can connect with you. And that was right under connection details here where it says node ID. You can simply uh, copy to clipboard here or you can show this as a QR code, which anybody can then scan if they are in front or if you're trying to connect uh, another wallet to it. Uh, whatever it may be. Nonetheless, this is the information that I need and I can just tap to copy it. Now, as I said, there's a number of different ways you can connect, but let's say you had somebody that was willing to connect with you uh, and open a channel to you. Well, all they would do is you would give them the information that you've copied here. And I do have my other lightning node uh, loaded up here. This is one that I have on Umbral. Okay, and so I can uh, go ahead and open a channel uh, via, this is Thunderhub. It's another interface that you can utilize in order uh, to open and maintain channels on a lightning node. Uh, so really what I'm doing here is I am uh, pasting in the information that I just got. And so this is the node ID. In fact, I can look up the node via 1ml.com. You can take a look and you can look up node public keys, aliases, anything to get information and connection information uh, to that node. So for instance, I named my, uh, my node Sessions Blitz. So I can search for that and it pops up here. And uh, in some instances for connections, you may just need the public key, but in a lot of instances, you're gonna need this longer string down below and that's your connection info. And it has uh, at the end, it'll say dot onion um, and have a little uh, port number at the end. So this is typically the information that you really need to connect. And that's what we're gonna be using. If you have not renamed your Raspberry Blitz uh, node, which we will get into later in this video, then you can simply search up uh, via the home screen the node ID. So the same information that you copied earlier can be pasted into a 1ML and you'll be able to look up and get your full connection info there. And I can just simply Again, in Thunderhub, I can paste that information. It's the exact same information, just uh, added uh, a little bit at the end here, dot onion. Uh, nonetheless, let's open a channel, again, for 2 million sats. And let's see, we'll do... Oh, and this is a great opportunity to utilize one of the apps that we have which is mempool.space. Remember we downloaded that earlier. So I'm gonna open that up. And this gives us an overview of uh, the current fee environment on the Bitcoin blockchain right now. So I can see uh, if I'm wanting to get in on the next block, I'm gonna need at least 12 sats per byte. But if I'm willing to wait a little bit, you know, I can have a pretty low fee of maybe one sat per byte. However, I did have to bump earlier, so I'm gonna play it safe. I'm gonna have a higher fee on this one. Nonetheless, channel size of 2 million sats. Uh, I'm going to put it to 13 sats per byte. And let's see if this works. Success it says channel has been opened and it'll just be a matter of time before that confirms on the Bitcoin blockchain and we'll be able to see it reflected over here on Ride the Lightning. So we'll be back when that happens. But in the meantime, let's look at some other options in terms of getting inbound channels. So one of them would be zero fee routing. Okay. Uh, and so this 
uh, this is basically a service that enables you to get inbound channels to your lightning node and the person has opted to not add any fees to the channels um, there is a fee in order for them to open up liquidity with you they will lock up that liquidity for 90 days and then reevaluate after that depending on if the channel is active or not um, for more info on that there is info down below nonetheless zerofeerouting.com i can paste in the exact same information that I have before. And then I can say, well, how large of a channel would I like? So I'm going to say right now, I'd like a, hmm, say a 1 million sat channel. So this is going to cost me 10,000 Satoshis in order to do this. So I'm going to hit get. And then it asks me, to pay this invoice, all right? And so I can do this via any Lightning wallet I currently have open. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to copy this invoice, all right? Um, so I'll copy that. And I'm gonna go over to my other node here and I'm gonna go to my home and I'm going to go send, I'm going to paste in that invoice and let it populate here. Okay, it says 10,000 sats to uh, zero fee routing. Okay, you can set a, a max fee in terms of getting the payment there. Um, again, all of these details are not super necessary. You can literally use any uh, any lightning wallet to pay this something like moon wallet on your phone m u u n which i've done a video on will work just fine nonetheless i'm paying this with my other lightning node i'll hit pay here hopefully i've got a route payment sent there we go so i should see there we go zero c zero fee routing okay um and then it says if a channel does not open within a couple minutes, please add me as a peer. So I'm just going to preemptively uh, add add this person as a peer, just for good measure, because I saw it there. So uh, I'll paste in that information. I'll hit add peer. Okay, so the uh, zero fee routing has been added as a, f as a peer. I'm just going to hit do it later because I don't want to open another channel. That should be incoming momentarily. And by the way, we can see uh, that my other node is now a peer as well. And um, perfect. So we'll, we should have incoming channels soon, but we can see the peers that are linked up here. Now, really quick, let's take a look at uh, some other options for getting inbound channels. Uh, amboss.space slash magma is a place where you can uh, take orders and or rather order inbound channels. So we can see that here. Um, I've done a full video on how this works, so be sure to check that out in the links down below. Also, once you've got a decent number of channels going, uh, both in and out, then you may want to take a look at lightningnetwork.plus. This is where you can link up with multiple other parties and create triangles, squares, pentagons of channels between yourselves, which have the, have the benefit of connecting to more than a single peer with a single connection. Um, and this is a great website. I love it. I use it all the time. Uh, another great option would be Voltage, and this utilizes uh, this utilizes Lightning Terminal uh, and allows you to again order inbound channels via their Flow product, which is super awesome. I've done a video on that as well. Uh, so a, a good number of options here. There's also things like Bit Refill um, where you can order inbound channels too. So lots of options here. Uh, but we should have a couple inbound channels shortly here, and we'll be back when that happens. All right, final update here on our node. We can now see 
We of course have our lightning balances with two open channels going outbound. We have our remaining on-chain balance for a total of just shy of 5 million sats. If we look down below, we see four active channels. And if we look over to the right, we can see our channels and capacity. So we can see total capacity, we have local 4 million sats and we have remote 3 million sats. And the way that that works is we opened up two separate channels, uh, which are outbound channels with 2 million sats each, which are spendable. And then we had two inbound channels created with us, one from, um, we'll, we'll call it a friend's node, but it's another node that I have open. Uh, so I opened a 2 million sat channel to this node. And then we used zero fee routing and we paid to get an inbound channel for 1 million sats right here. Uh, so all of those are now up and available and we can now begin to pay out and receive transactions on our node. So let's go ahead and do that. And now we can do that a couple different ways. We can go from uh, the main interface on Raspi Blitz or we can go through Ride the Lightning. Uh, let's just take a look at the differences between them. Uh, but from uh, from our Ride the Lightning, we're gonna hit the drop down menu under Lightning and we're going to Transactions. And here we can either do payments or invoices. So I'm going to pull up something where we can send a payment. So here is a donation that I'm giving to the Human Rights Foundation. Uh, and on this page, I basically just created a donation for five bucks and it's paying with lightning and there's an invoice down below. So all I really need to do is copy this invoice right here and jump over to Ride the Lightning. And from my Ride the Lightning uh, page, I'm gonna hit send payment. I'm gonna paste in that invoice. It'll tell me what it's for. Hey, you're sending around 25,000 sats to the Human Rights Foundation. I'm gonna go ahead and hit send payment and we'll jump back and just wait for that to go through. All right, there we go. Invoice has been paid and, uh, and it jumps back after showing that to me. Uh, so we're all set there. Go ahead back into Ride the Lightning. Um, and I believe we can just refresh the payments history here. Oh, actually it shows up right there. All right, so we have successfully done that transaction. We can see down below, now I've been, I was playing around with other transactions prior to, prior to recording this part, but uh, you can see this transaction going out for 25,000 sats. That's the one to the Human Rights Foundation. I had a couple tests down here. Um, and if I go back to the dashboard, we can actually see that it went out via the channel uh, Wallet of Satoshi because we can see the remote balances, 25,000 some odd sats there, um, whereas local is 1.9 million or so in that range. So we know that uh, some some uh, Bitcoin flowed out of that channel uh, to the other side, which means I can also now receive through that same channel. All right. Um, speaking of receiving, let's take a look at how we would receive a transaction via Lightning. So uh, within Ride the Lightning, uh, you go down to transactions and now we're going to click on invoices. So you can create an invoice using this button here. You can give it a description. We'll just call it test. How many sats are you looking to receive? Um, I'm going to just say, for simplicity's sake, we'll say 2000 sats. Okay, uh, expiry, you can really set whatever you like. Um, it can go by seconds, minutes, hours. Uh, so I'm just gonna say that this will expire in, in one hour. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna hit create invoice. And so this will create a scannable QR code that any Lightning Wallet could, uh, could scan and pay to. And it will create a Bolt 11 invoice which you can copy uh, and paste and send to anybody you please. So I am actually going to copy this invoice here and We'll jump over. I have opened up on the other screen uh, Blue Wallet. 
all right? And it says, hey, you have a lightning invoice in your clipboard. Would you like to use it for a transaction? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hit continue and say yes. Uh, it gives me a summary, 2000 sats, around 40 cents going to this invoice uh, and I'm just gonna hit pay. All right, that looks like it has gone off just fine. And if I jump back, I can actually close out of this screen and I can see, hey, amount and the amount settled. So I've now received 2000 sats. So I want to show you how to SSH into your Raspi Blitz, uh, which is done using the terminal. Okay, so the terminal is command line prompts that allows you to interact with this. Now, I know a lot of people hearing this at first are gonna go, oh my God, this seems way too complicated. Bear with me here, it's not that scary. First, what you're gonna do to get access to your Raspi Blitz on your same network is you're gonna type SSH, then you're gonna type in the IP address of your device, the one that you looked up before, the same one that you pasted into your browser window to access this pretty looking interface here, okay? Uh, if you're unfamiliar where to find it again, but you're already on it, it'll be actively up in your search bar above, or it'll be down here under connection details. Uh, it'll say admin at, but then you'll have the IP address itself and you can just type that in. So you're gonna be typing admin at, and then your IP address. And then hit enter. At this point, you're gonna be prompted for your password, which is the original one that you first set up, your first password. You type it in, you won't see any response from the keyboard here. So it's just, it won't show the number of characters you've typed and then you hit enter. All right, this bumps you in to your main menu for your Raspi Blitz. Um, you can do a lot of different things from here. Now, this info up top, this will be the same information that is shown on the screen attached to your Raspberry Pi, if you do have one there. Um, down below, you can see options for your core Lightning wallet, or if you're uh, opted to run LND, then that would be here as well. Um, Core Lightning uh, web interface. This is, the web interface is what we are looking at, um, what we've been using this whole time here. Uh, so that's the web interface. Um, it will just tell you what to put in your browser window to find it from here. Um, the Electrum Rust server. Now, this is something that we do want to use here uh, in connecting external wallets to our, um, to our Raspi Blitz. And why you might wanna do this is so that you can um, trust your copy of the Bitcoin blockchain rather than somebody else's. Now this will work with a local wallet on the same network. So if you're working from a, a home computer or a laptop at home, then this will be ideal. Mempool.space, we downloaded that app and this will just uh, take you to there. It'll show you how to access it from your browser, but we already know. Um, node settings and options, services, system, all this stuff is stuff that we're gonna take a look at. So node settings and options, you just hit enter. And by the way, I'm navigating just with the arrows on my keyboard, just up and down and then enter to take a look at it. Now, uh, this basically allows us to activate and deactivate different things. So, um, you know, it's running behind Tor, Core Lightning Node, all of these different things. It just allows us to turn these things off and on. And all you would do is you press space bar on a particular one you wanna enable or disable, and then go down and hit okay uh, by hitting enter. Now, I don't wanna change anything here, so I'm going to tap to the right, which highlights the cancel button and I will go back. Let's take a look at services. Now this is something that we're gonna do now and there will be a bit of a delay between you doing this and you being able to do the next steps but uh, you can see here, 
the top option, Electrum Rust Server, for me, there's a star there because I've activated it prior to this video um, and it does take, can be a few hours to a day to fully get running. It basically takes your copy of the Bitcoin blockchain, indexes it so that it's very easy to reference and uh, provide that information to other wallets. So in order to activate that, you, uh, you're, the box beside it will be empty. You're gonna hit the space bar there and then you're going to uh, just hit enter and that will update and it will download. You'll see a bunch of things pop up, a little menu, it'll start downloading things um, and you just leave it. You let it do its thing and, uh, and it'll take a few hours, maybe a day, and that will be all updated. Now, there are other things here. We can see RPC Explorer, Spectre Desktop, Join Market. There's a lot of different things that you can install that aren't available currently on the web interface that we've been interacting with. This one here um, in the apps section. My guess is eventually you won't have to do this via the command line, um, but for now, at the time of recording this video, they're not yet available via this interface. So you can enact them here, all right? Um, so for instance, if I wanted to go and let's see what's something that I want. Uh, join market would be kind of cool to have. So I can hit the space bar and if I had some other ones, I would just hit spacebar on them, whatever I wanted to enact. Um, and then I would just hit enter. So I hit enter. And so it brings up a bunch of stuff. I don't really have to uh, fully understand exactly uh, what is going on here. Um, but it, you can see it at the bottom, it says install join market. Okay, running behind Tor. Um, so it's, it's working away. It will install join market and then it will bring me back to my main screen. Once it's all done, we'll come back in a second for that. After a little while, you'll get this message. Hey, this has been installed and uh, just kind of gives you some instructions on how to use it. We're not diving into join market today, but I just wanted to give an example of how to install one of these applications. So the main thing that I wanted to take a look at here on the terminal window was the Core Lightning Wallet options. Um, so if we just navigate down with the arrows to CLN and we hit enter, then we get uh, a number of things which is available using the, uh, the browser interface. So things like funding, adding a peer, opening channels, sending, receiving payments, all that kind of stuff. It's all here. However, there's a couple other things that aren't. So you can change the name or alias of the node and that is available right here. You simply tap it, you put in the new alias, it will reboot and then you will see that reflected in your user interface. Uh, you can also close out all your channels. You can cash out or withdraw all funds on chain. Um, and you can also see show the seed words of the wallet as well. And there's some repair functions here too. So all of that is in here and uh, particularly useful for managing your lightning node. I imagine some of those uh, some of those features and some of those settings will gradually, again, be integrated into the user interface via the browser over time. Finally, down at the bottom here, you're gonna see things like repair options, updating your Raspi Blitz, uh, rebooting, power off, all things that you can get through the main menu there. But if you are ever unable to access your Raspi Blitz via the browser, then you can always SSH into it via a terminal window. So it's important to realize that this is here and it may have a few settings and features that is not currently available using the interface we've been doing so far. Now, another thing that I wanted to showcase here has to do, again, with the um, Electrum Rust server that we spun up on our node. And that would be connecting an external wallet to use your Raspi Blitz as your node of choice so that you're verifying your own transactions and your own Bitcoin blocks and not relying on somebody else to do it for you. So this will work for really any wallet that's on your local network here. And so as an example, I've got Sparrow Wallet. So within Sparrow, you're just gonna go 
to the preferences menu and then you're going to go to server and then you're going to go private electrum and what you're going to do here is you're actually going to paste in the ip address of your node the same one that you use to access it via your browser and then beside that you're going to put the port number now uh, it will kind of depend it can either be 50001 or 50002 but you can test out both of them 50001 worked for me and you just hit test connection after you get a message that the test has been a success, you can close that window and you will see a blue toggle switch in the bottom right indicating you are connected to your own Raspi Blitz node. Now, if you've been watching up to this point and thinking to yourself, geez, this is you know a lot of a lot of hoops to jump through or maybe the user interface isn't as friendly as you would like it to be well here is your solution to be able to use uh, your lightning node uh, in a, a, I would say a pretty friendly app and on the go and that's what we're going to be doing here we're going to be connecting something called Zeus now, this is the ZeusLN.app website, and uh, you can get this app for your iPhone, for your Android phone, um, whatever you like. It, I've done videos on this before, so if you want, uh, again, fully detailed uh, tutorials on it, just be sure to check the show notes or uh, just search my YouTube channel if you can't find it down there um, and uh, get an in-depth tutorial of how to use it. But we're going to be connecting this and I've got to say that using Zeus with the Raspberry Blitz is uh, pretty, pretty simple actually. It's great. So we'll pull up what we need here uh, in our admin terminal here and then we will get it set up on the phone. So here on your admin terminal, you're going to go down to connect. You're going to select that and then you're going to select the first option which is mobile. At this point, you're going to have a few uh, a few options. Now, your your options may be different if you've opted to use uh, LND instead of C Lightning, but the it gives me the options that apply to me. So I'm just going to choose the first option here, uh, Zeus CL REST, which stands for C Lightning um, or Core Lightning REST, and so I'm going to hit Enter. And then it says, hey, you're gonna download this. Here's the website, the one we just had up, and you can download it onto your mobile device. When the app is installed and started, hit continue. So I'm gonna do that now. And so this is going to actually load up uh, a, a string of code that we can copy, or, um, and it's gonna represent it on the screen, at least partially, a QR code, as you can, partially see now some of it's obstructed here i can resize the window to see the whole thing um, but nonetheless it also shows this exact same qr code on the screen of my raspi blitz so my little node right now i'm looking over at it and the same qr code in its entirety is showed on that screen so we're going to be using this qr code uh, alongside the the zeus app on our phone so we'll jump to that view momentarily. And just to show you without revealing the entire QR code here, uh, that little screen has the QR code that can be scanned by Zeus right here. And that's what we're gonna be doing. Okay, so here is the main screen of Zeus. Once I've downloaded and opened up the app, we're just gonna hit get started. Uh, and then we're gonna hit connect a node. There's a little plus sign in the top right that you're gonna tap. And before we do anything else here, we're not gonna manually put in information. We're gonna use that QR code that was up on our screen, uh, but we're gonna change one thing where it says node interface. We're gonna hit the drop down. And if you're using LND, you leave it B, but if you're using C Lightning, like I started with in this video, you're gonna choose C Lightning REST right there. And at that point, you go down to the bottom, uh, middle option where it says scan C Lightning REST QR and this will open up your camera. I'm just gonna scan the QR code off screen here momentarily. This fills in all relevant information for me here and I can just give the node a name and then I'll hit save node config down at the bottom 
the white button. All right, and we are looking good. We've got a total balance up top. We've got our lightning balance and on-chain balance separated. If I tap the arrow at the bottom, then it's gonna bring up all of our previous transactions that we've done through the node and it takes a second to load that information. There we go. So we can see all of that is accurate there. We can X out of that and we can now transact utilizing this, uh, utilizing this app, which is connected directly to our own node. So really quick, uh, let's receive a lightning transaction. So when you tap on lightning, you can hit receive and uh, you can give it a memo if you want, but we'll just do test. Um, we'll just do a small one of a thousand sats and we'll hit create invoice. All right, so this creates uh, an invoice that we can copy or we can hit show QR code if somebody needed to scan that. But for me, I'm just gonna copy the invoice. Let's jump over to another lightning wallet I've got. So we'll just do moon wallet here. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna hit send. It sees the invoice in my clipboard, I'll paste that. All right, so. Oh, and I guess I did 100 sats, not 1,000 sats. Nonetheless, it'll work just fine. So 100 sats, one sat fee, hit send. Off it goes. If I back up here, check our activity. All right, there we go. We see a received transaction for 100 sats right up top there. Perfect. So what about sending out? Well, let's just try the other way. So we'll open up our moon wallet once more. I'll hit receive, lightning, and we'll do an invoice for mm, $1, one US dollar, which is about 5,000 sats. There's our invoice, which I will copy and we'll jump back over to Zeus. And we're gonna tap lightning, send. It sees that there's an invoice on my clipboard, so it's gonna paste that in, and we'll just confirm it's the correct one once it comes up. All right, so 5,000 sats. Uh, there's a, a fee routing limit that is, is set there. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna hit pay this invoice. All right, I see a notification from Moon up top. I see Zeus showing me that I have successfully made the payment. I'll go back to the wallet. Let's check out what Moon has in store for us. And we'll go up here and I can see a recent transaction. You were paid 5,051 sats. So I've got to say the experience with Zeus is uh, pretty seamless um, connected to my Raspberry Blitz. It's easy to connect, easy to transact. Everything is kind of right here at the ready um, and uh, just a pretty simple experience all around. Uh, all of the relevant settings and everything are in the back end here if you tap the top left. Uh, and again, you can see your channels listed here, inbound and outbound, all of that information will be located in the channels tab down below. I'm not gonna dive too deep into Zeus here. I do have, again, as I mentioned, full tutorials on how it works, uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to show that it does indeed work with your Raspberry Blitz, and it's pretty easy to set up. By the way, to get out of this QR screen, you just hit uh, enter a couple of times and you'll be booted right back to the main, uh, the main menu. So we'll just do that right there. And then you're right back to the main menu. If you wish to exit from your node, you can simply go to the bottom right, hit exit, and then type in exit in terminal and you'll be booted back to uh, your MacBook at, or whatever computer you're using. At that point, you can shut down terminal, and there you go. So I just wanna finish up with some final thoughts here. Uh, my journey through setting up building, setting up, and using my Raspi Blitz. So uh, I love assembling these things. It's a lot of fun. Obviously, I gave you a couple different options through the setup. It's entirely up to you. Just keep in mind that parts 
as of the making of this video are a tad expensive due to supply chain issues and just not a lot of Raspi's being on the market the past couple years. That seems to be changing. So just keep an eye out. Prices may be coming down um, as we speak or in the future. In terms of actually getting the thing up and running and flashing the SD card, very similar to other node implementations. So no problems there. Very simple to do. Uh, accessing the node and using uh, Raspberry Blitz via the web user interface. Now at this point, I'm going to note, this is the first release of the web user interface. And what I mean by that is being able to have a nice pretty looking screen that you see in a regular web browser to access your node. This was just released, so brand new. Before this, it was all done via SSH, opening up a terminal window, entering commands, all that kind of stuff. So um, just so you're aware, this is the first, you're seeing it right out the gate. Um, that said, it wasn't exactly uh, consistent as I was using it. And that's to be expected in an early release like this. Uh, and what I mean by that is I tried to represent in the video the way that things should function, but I did encounter errors along the way. Most commonly, the transaction window uh, on the right-hand side of the screen would often shoot back an error or wouldn't populate, so I'd have to navigate over to like the app screen and then back to the home screen to get it to refresh. Sometimes I would log into the web UI and I would just kind of get that spinning circle and it just wouldn't load. And so in those instances, the real only way to access it, it I would still be able to get to uh, the setting screen and reboot it, or I could do that via SSH if I so chose. So, um, yeah, some, some issues, just things loading up and, and being represented uh, correctly. A um, couple other little bugs that I noticed. Most of the copy buttons I actually found didn't copy the text it was supposed to copy, so I would manually highlight and right-click to copy those things. Not the end of the world, but just another thing that I'm sure will be ironed out in future releases. Um, and then outside of that, uh, I mean... There were a, a, a few little things. Um, I just found it the web UI was not as quick and snappy as using um, SSH. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, but I did find that it seemed to maybe use a lot of resources or it seemed to slow down the node itself. Um, and if I was trying to use the web UI and then I went to SSH via ter a terminal window, it would seem a little bit slower than I was used to. Now, let's chat about uh, SSH and using the node that way. Because you can do everything via terminal window that you would do with the, the nice looking web UI. And I found when I just kind of focused on SSH and uh, navigating those menus and doing all that, it, it basically worked seamlessly. It worked very, very well. They've really nailed down what's happening in the back end there um, and being able to execute those commands and get things, getting things to function properly um, works beautifully in SSH. I think it's just a matter of time before that gets properly represented in the web UI and is as seamless. Plus via the SSH, you saw there's additional settings, there's additional apps and tons of different things that you can add in that aren't yet available in web UI. So um, I guess my takeaway there is it will come. We've seen this happen with other node implementations where, you know, things were buggy and then, you know, the developers continue to work on it and things get smoother and smoother over time. So I think that's kind of the position that Raspi Blitz is in works beautifully with SSH, web UI, first step out the gate, looks really nice. When it works, it's great, um, but you will encounter the odd error here and there as you're playing with it. Um, in terms of connecting external wallets, connecting uh, on my local network to Sparrow worked beautifully, no problems there. Connecting via Zeus was actually quite nice. I've got to say, I've used Zeus with other nodes and other uh, other Lightning implementations, so LND. And uh, C Lightning on the Raspberry Blitz was probably the quickest, snappiest, and most seamless 
utilization of Zeus wallet that I've had thus far. The scanning the QR code and importing the node information happened way faster than it's happened anywhere else. So uh, I don't know why it's so good that way, but it is, uh, and that's fantastic. So kudos to whoever's responsible for that working so well together. Um, nonetheless, really had a lot of fun utilizing this. I'm gonna keep it up and running and uh, I'm going to continue to play and watch as things progress with the Raspberry Blitz, especially that web user interface. As I know, a lot of people tend to shy away from anything done in terminal. I get that some things are beyond people's comfort levels or level of caring, I suppose. Uh, so nonetheless, if you're curious, dive in. Yeah, uh, boot up a Raspberry Blitz. Um, you can use the same hardware with any other nodes that you may want to. So if you try this one and you want to try something else afterwards, you can do that. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm just really happy about the optionality and that I've got yet another node that I can play with and learn from. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, please do hit like, subscribe, share. All those things are super important. They really help get content like this in front of more eyeballs. A big thank you to everybody that's been doing that. If you want to help the show in another way, you can hit up the previously mentioned sponsors in the show notes down below. There are links for CoinKite, ShakePay, Ledin.io, BitRefill, and Bill Foddle at PrivacyPros.io. Uh, and finally, if you really liked what you saw, you can always drop me a Bitcoin tip at my strike page. That is strike.me slash BTC sessions. You head there, type in any amount you want. You hit the tip button. You will be greeted with a lightning invoice, which perhaps you're going to be using your new node to pay that invoice. Uh, or if you prefer, tap the arrow to the right, you'll see a regular Bitcoin QR code. With that, I'm out. Have yourselves a wonderful day or evening, wherever you may be. See you guys next time for your daily session. Huddle the Bitcoin.